for centuries, these lands were home to many people and civilizations, but none more so than the Greeks and Turks. But a treaty that was supposed to guarantee their respective futures only led to decades of tensions, while some of those rights disappear. Ezme, sindirme, korkutma. Hepsi var. Yunan devleti bize Yunanlı Müslümanlar diye hitap ediyor. Bunun altında yatan da yarın öbür gün bunlar Türk olmaktan söylemi, Türk olduğunu söylemekten usanıp, bıkıp veyahut da Yunanlı olmayı daha çok isteyecekleri bir kıvama gelsinler diye baskı yoluyla bunu bize yapmaktadır. Toplumların ihtiyaçları var. Fakat bu meyanda Rum toplumunun nüfusu son derecede azaldı. Join me as I journey throughout Turkey and Greece to look at the complicated relationship between these two neighbors and how they treat their minorities. Mankind's Great War. After the silencing of the cannons, a new world would be emerging, leaving behind centuries-old empires to the pages of history. From the territories that were occupied and the lands that were annihilated, a new nation would rise. The Treaty of Lausanne in 1923 officially settled the conflict between the Ottoman Empire and the Allied forces. Turkey gave up all claims to the remainder of the defeated empire. In return, the Allies recognized the Turkish Republic's sovereignty and new borders. Biz bugün bir istikrar savaşından geldik. Bizim davalarımız var. Bunların hepsini halletmek mecburiyetindeyiz. The treaty also granted protection to minorities, specifically the Greek Orthodox in Turkey and the Muslims in Greece. But most of the Christian population of Turkey and the Turkish population of Greece had already been deported under an earlier population exchange. Only the Greek Orthodox of Istanbul and the Muslims of Western Thrace were excluded. And it is here where my quest to better understand the Greek minority in Istanbul begins. The district of Fener tucked away in the back streets of this unassuming neighborhood on the banks of the Golden Horn, St. George's Cathedral. For a thousand years, it was the touchstone of ecclesiastical affairs, and in some regards, the center of Christianity. I've been invited by the church and will have the rare opportunity to sit down with the spiritual leader of more than 300 million Orthodox Christians at one of the most enduring institutions of the world at one of the most important times. <laughs> Nearly a century ago, Istanbul was home to several hundred thousand Greek Orthodox. Today, however, only a fraction of them remain. And today, this community is gathering to celebrate Easter O açıdan hiçbir problemimiz yok. Yani Rum vatandaşlarımız serbestçe kiliselerine gidiyor, e, ibadetlerini yapıyor. E, çok kolaylık gösteriliyor. Hiçbir engel veya problem çıkmıyor bu hususta. E, çanlarımızı çalıyoruz kiliselerde. There may be a feeling of celebration ringing in the air, but there is concern among community leaders that a future generation will not be able to hold on to its traditions. İşte burada bildiğiniz gibi bir urban okulumuz vardı Heybeliada da Osmanlı döneminde kurulan, açılan bir okul. 
sırf teoloji, ilahiyat vermek için, ilahiyat dersleri vermek için ve kilisemizin, yalnız Padrikenemizin değil, diğer yurt dışındaki kiliselerin. Perched in Princess's Islands is the Halki Seminary the main school of theology of the Eastern Orthodox Church. That is, until the Turkish parliament enacted a law banning private higher education institutions. Since 1971, it's been closed. Today, the only people that roam the hallways are visitors, not students. The closure of the seminary is a sensitive issue between Turkey and Greece. The school has not had a graduating class for almost 50 years. No graduates has meant that the theological school hasn't been able to provide the clergymen and scholars, even patriarchs, to the church it has done for centuries. But the Turkish government has stepped in and has offered what it says is a solution. It could prove to be a lifeline for the 2,000-year-old faith in its ancient homeland. Turkish law requires that the patriarch be a citizen, and the government has offered citizenship to foreign archbishops. It's seen as a way to expand the next generation of Orthodox leaders. Being a minority anywhere in the world is often difficult, and the Greek minority in Istanbul has had to endure some difficult times. But the last two decades has seen somewhat of a revival. Lakivingas is a leading member of Istanbul's Greek community. He says the two communities are locked in so tightly, a new approach was needed. Öyle çok geniş kapsamda var olan bugünkü nüfus yapımıza uymayan bir yapımız olduğu için onu daha merkezi, daha birbirine bağlı bir şekilde bütün cephelerimizi azaltarak, küçülterek, belki konularımızı da genelleştirerek çözüm yoluna gittik. Previously closed down Greek schools are once again reopening. The numbers of members eligible for the Holy Synod are as high as ever. And the rights of vast properties belonging to minority foundations are now guaranteed under law. But across the Sea of Marmara and over the border, the situation is different. 150 kilometers west of the Turkish-Greek border, my first stop in western Thrace was to be the town of Santi. A town that is home to nearly half of the ethnic Turkish population in the area. I thought to myself, this could very well be any town in western Turkey, with its minarets and steeples peering above the surrounding low-rise buildings. And then, as if it were a sign from up above. Successive Greek government policies have failed to acknowledge the existence of an ethnic Turkish community, instead referring to them as Greek Muslims. This is the Shanti Turkish Union. It's the oldest non-governmental organization in Western Thrace. It, it's back to 1927 and for decades after its founding there was a sign above the entrance that stated its official name but back in 1983 the Shanti governorship ordered its removal mainly because it had the word Turkish in its name. Displayed on the walls reminders of their community's rich heritage, while members come to enjoy a hot beverage and solve crossword puzzles in their native tongue. Also enshrined, names of lost fathers, uncles and brothers who died fighting for Greece. The head of the Santi Turkish Association tells me there's been a policy to rid the Turkish identity from every aspect of life, 
and that dates back to 1983's declaration of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. The Greek government at the time said it wanted to prevent Western Thrace being ceded to Turkey. That sometimes meant that ethnic Turks could no longer continue with their favorite leisurely activities. Their football field of dreams turned into a parking lot. Orhan Hacihafuz was the captain of a local championship team. It just so happened that the name of his team had the word Turkish in it. And just like many things Turkish in 1983, the final whistle was blown on his team. Football bana belki çok pahalıya mal olmuştur bazıları açısından fakat ben pişmanlık duymuyorum. Futbol yüzünden okuyamadım. Lise 1'de okulu terk etmek zorunda kaldım. O kadar iç içe yaşıyordum ki futboldan. İmtihanlarım olduğu zaman kitabı alır ders çalışırım. Ha sabahleyin çalışırım derim. Bir bakarım ki kitap elimde uyumuştum. I felt the passion in his voice when he was talking about his old days. Therefore, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to kick around a ball with a veteran. It was clear that he still had skills. Soon enough, we were approached by a youngster, Orhan's grandson. It turned into a multi-generational kick around. But it was apparent that the little one still had a lot to learn from his grandfather. The denial of ethnic and cultural identity is just one of the hardships that people belonging to the Turkish minority of Western Thrace say they have to deal with. But what happens if it also affects your national identity? Ali Jabi says he is the victim of a controversial article that was in Greece's constitution. Article 19 stated that a person of non-Greek ethnic origin leaving the country could be declared as having lost Greek nationality. Adi found himself in this predicament when he left Greece to visit his family in 1977. Three years later, when he returned, he found out that Greek authorities had taken away his citizenship. Yani bir yerde bir işim olmazdı. Kimliğim yok. Sayılmazdım yani. A stateless person for nearly 40 years. Think of all the things you'd want to do, but can't. Mesela bir iş yapacağım kimlik soru, kimliğim yok. Hasta olacağım, hastaneye gideceğim, kimliğim yok. Ee, ne bileyim, bir hayvan alacağım. But the problems of the Turkish minority aren't only confined to those who live in western Thrace. About 15 kilometers outside of Santi, on the banks of the Nestos River, is where the jurisdictional territory of the Treaty of Luzon ends. My next stop is the port city of Thessaloniki. It's Greece's second largest city, but it was once one of the Ottoman Empire's most important trading hubs. It was once home to several hundred thousand ethnic Turks, but in the aftermath of the Greco-Turkish War, the convention concerning the exchange of Greek and Turkish populations saw most, if not all of them, expelled similar to the Greeks being deported from all across Anatolia. As a result, the streets of Thessaloniki had been emptied of its Muslim residents. Greek nationalists tore down hundreds of minarets. Today, the city's Muslim heritage is left unattended. To find out more, I want to talk to the Muslim Union of Thrace. Özellikle okul yok. Yani Yunanistan bizi bunu kabul etmiyor burada. Mesela 
e, Türk okullar olsun diye. Çünkü e, sketchinin aşağı kabul ediyor ama Selanik'te kabul etmiyor. Çünkü Lozan Anlaşması diyor, onu sen kabul etmiyor buralarını. Burada yerleştik. Onun için burada istiyoruz ki bizim bir ibadet yerimiz olsun, bir de özellikle mesela bir de mezarlığımız olsun. Buradan mez cenazelerimiz biz buradan getiriyoruz 500 kilometre uzak. Bak Yahudilerim var, Yahudilerin mezarlığı var. Bir de bu Ermenilerin mezarlığı ayrı. Bunların ayrı mezarlıklar var. Ama bize gelince onlar yok mezarlık bize. Türklere yok mezarlık. Beneath many of these unmarked tombstones are ethnic Turks who lived all across Greece. Some of their families have had to travel hundreds of kilometers so their deceased relatives could be buried according to Muslim tradition. Rabia lost her husband six months ago and finds comfort in frequently visiting his grave. Çok acı bıraktı bizi ama ne yapalım? Allah'ın emri. Haftada üç dört sefer geliyorum. Geliyorum, konuşuyorum, derdimi anlatıyorum. Ne yapalım? Allah'ın emri sonunda da diyorsun o kadarmış. Rabia's husband was a close friend of Ahmet Mete, who's the elected müftü of Santi. There are actually two müftis in this town. One that the local Turkish Muslim minority elect and one that is appointed by the Greek state. Ahmed says that this violates multiple historical treaties. Biz Batırak'a Müslüman Türk azınlığı olarak mütekabiliyet esasının işletilmesini hep istedik. Türkiye'de bu kadar vakıflar Yunanlara, Hristiyanlara iade edildi. Efendim mitropolit olayını biliyorsunuz her şehre bir mitropolit atandı. Bizde eskiden müftüler varken bu müftülerin hepsi ilga edildi, müftülüklerin hepsi ilga edildi. Yalnız Batı Trakya'da bırakıldı. Bunlar hepsi mütekabiliyet esasına iki devletin karşılıklı efendim çözeceği sorunlardır ve biz bunun tekrar oluşmasını istiyoruz. And nearly all of the local Turkish minority are there attending the prayer service of the elected mufti and not the one appointed by the Greek state. But Ahmet Mete says the issue is just a formality, that there are more pressing issues for the community. Asıl aciliye tarz eden ve çözüm bekleyen sorun eğitim. Çünkü çocuklar büyüyor. Eğitim bir yerde duruyor, çocuklar büyüyor, gidiyor. Ve eğitimsiz bir şekilde, zayıf bir eğitimle çocukların büyümesi hayatlarını etki ediyor. Onun için aciliyet arz eden eğitimdir, okullardır. Bunun efendim önce görülmesi lazım. Giderilmesi lazım. Ondan sonra evet müftülükler gelir, ondan sonra vakıflar gelir, ondan sonra kimlik sorunu gelir. Hepsi bunlar iç içe aslında ve batırak yazılığını ilgilendiren e, olaylar. If education was one of the most pressing issues, then I had to go and visit a school and see for myself. Next to the Santi Turkish Association is one of the few remaining schools that the Turkish minority has in the area. It's almost the end of the school day and parents are waiting to pick up their children. Among the crowd is Rasim. He's here to pick up his grandchildren. This school has a special meaning for Rasim. Not only did he attend the school for primary education, but it's also where he came back to, to teach for more than three decades. With classes ending, children pour out of the gate. Rasim finds his grandchildren, but he's worried about the education they're getting. Eğitim kadromuz bugün bu şeyde Türkiye öğretmen okum çıkışlı hiçbir öğretmenimiz kalmadı. Bütün bunlar ihraç edildi. Okul dışı bırakıldı. Hiçbirimizin isteği olmadı bu ve gerçekleşti. Biz de ayrıldık. Ve şimdi bugünkü kardeşlerimiz bunlar bir kısmı e, liselerden, Yunan liselerinin mezun, özel pedagojiye gitmişler, orada mezun olmuşlar. Böyle bir eğitim kadromuz var fakat ne yazık ki Türkçe çok zayıf. More than 60 Turkish schools have been closed since 2011. The Greek government says it's due to a lack of students. Çok muğla görüyoruz. Eğitimi çok karanlık görüyoruz. Çünkü geçmişten bugüne kadar irdelediğimizde eğitimimizi bugün ne safhat olduğunu ve bundan sonra nereye gidebileceğini biz eğitimci olarak az çok fark ediyoruz. Yani iyiye gidiş diye bir şey görmüyoruz maalesef.
The Turkish minority face many educational challenges. Many of the people that we've spoken to say it's the number one issue. But like Aristotle said, the roots of education can be bitter, but the fruit is sweet. So the question is, how can a community better prepare themselves for the future, raise their doctors, their lawyers, the jobs of tomorrow, when they're faced with so many obstacles? The last leg of our journey takes us back to Turkey, to the northern Aegean island of Gökçada, a two-hour ferry ride from Gallipoli to an island where many of Istanbul's Greek minority have their roots. And since I left Western Thrace taking a look at schools, I wanted to start off here on the island by seeing what the situation was for the Greek minority. This is the island's only Greek primary school. A half century ago, it had more than 150 students, including the Istanbul-based patriarch. But it had to close its doors in 1975 due to a lack of students. Today, after a major renovation by the Turkish Ministry of Education, life in the halls has returned. Classrooms are abuzz, even if it means only four children for an entire grade. Further up the hill is another Greek school, a high school. It's also been completely rebuilt, offering students all the comforts of education in the 21st century. Today's science lesson for this small group of students is how electrical currents work. It's a half day of school, and all of the island's 400 students gather at this amphitheater for a special occasion. Children's Day in Turkey is truly a unique event. The founder of the Turkish Republic, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, presented this day to all the world's children to emphasize that they are the successors of the future. And students from schools across the country put on shows like this. Today, here in Gökçada, Students from the Greek primary school join their fellow students from Turkish schools from around the island for a final round of rehearsals before the big day. It warmed my heart to see the island's Greek minority taking part in a collective activity with the other students. I couldn't leave the island without paying a visit to one of the island's most well-known residents. Wanting to reconnect to his roots, Barba Yorgo came back to the village he was born after 32 years in Istanbul. Today, he's fulfilling a lifelong dream and has opened up a little cafe. Böyle politikalar bir daha tekerür etmesin. Ne burada, ne Yunanistan'da. Dediğim gibi, ne ben Yorgo olarak, ne Batı Trakya'daki İsmail Mavrus arkadaşım, Gerçi vefat etti. Allah rahmet eylesin. Ee, rehine değiliz. Şartlar değişti. Bir değer kazandık. Çünkü ikinci sınıf vatandaştık. Doğrusu bu. Doğrusu bu. İkinci sınıf vatandaştık. Şimdi hakikaten birinci sınıf vatandaş. Olma yolundayız hiç olmazsa. Olduk ama olma yolundayız. Bunun bozulmasını istemiyoruz. It's hard to say if relations will ever reach the desired level. The Treaty of Lausanne was supposed to be a framework for both sides to continue living their lives the way they had for centuries. But there's been a denial of ethnic identity, the closing down of schools, problems over minority foundations, and restrictions on religious freedoms. What I've realized throughout my journey here is that on a very basic human level, both sides want to hold on to their past, but also be part of their changing environment. And most of all, avoid future conflict while exercising the rights that were promised. Bir gün bana dedi oturup ders çalışıyoruz. Bana dedi, Rey Yorgun, biz günahkar dolduk diyor. Niye dedim günahkar dolduk? Çünkü ikimiz de azınlıkta doğduk diyor. Azınlık kendi vakıf yöneticilerini seçmesi lazım ki bu hakkı bizden 
almıştır ve günümüze kadar da bu olmamaktadır.